Good morning, everybody. I believe we're going to get started with our webinar today. Although many careers are paused right now, certainly our personal development is not. So we're very excited um, to center on today's subject matter, how to ask for more and get it. I want to go through a couple of housekeeping items as we respect everybody's time and motion. And that is make sure you mute, mute your audio, excuse me, unless you're speaking. Um, if you could make sure you have no background noise. I know we all have kids and sometimes animals, so we want to be respectful of that. And if you have questions, put them in the chat box so we can flow everything in one central funnel and we'll get to them as quickly as possible. Also want to remind everybody, as we invest in ourselves, HSMAI has many resources that can be accessed through the website, hsmai.org. So you have a number of global resources regarding the COVID recovery. Um, also career development with university online education. And there's a number of certifications um, that can be done on your own time. And I would highly suggest that people go in and challenge themselves to make sure they have at least one certification. That's a true investment of yourself. And it speaks highly to your current employer or a prospective employer. Now, just a minute to introduce our board. Um, first, Mitch Woolley, president. And thank you so much, Mitch, for making arrangements for today. He's gonna to be driving the program. Samantha Rodriguez, our immediate past president. Myself, um, managing programs and education. Jennifer Pacelli, Vice President of our membership. David Barnett, Vice President of Finance. Craig Cabaneri, Vice President of so Social Media. LaVon Hi, LaVon Minor, Vice President of Sponsorships. Jody Flowers is Vice President of Student Affairs and the COVID Recovery. And then our Managing Director, Sandra Martinez. Mitch, I'll turn the program back over to you. Super, super. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we have a really, really good program for you today, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, our speaker today is Christine McKay, and she has an unconventional and unique story that led her from her childhood home in rural Montana to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, where she earned a BS in business. From there, she took her first corporate role at Bell Atlantic, which is now Verizon, where she first understood her passion for negotiating complex business relationships. After finishing her MBA at Harvard, she worked at Deloitte Consulting, where she would spend more than 11 years. Over the course of her 25-year career, Christine has negotiated with dozens of the Fortune 500. She's passionate about finding common ground, leveling the playing field, and resolving complex issues on behalf of her clients. Christine is a published author and has written for various publications, including Inc. Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Christine McKay. Christine. Thank you very much, Mitch. I am so honored to be here. And um, thank you for, to all of you for spending um, part of your day with me. I am very honored that you are sharing your most precious resource with me, which is your time. Um, but I do have a favor to ask. As this is a conversation about negotiation, I'm going to ask that unless you are recovering from major surgery um, that, or that you are in a car, that you please come on camera. Now, there's a study out of UCLA, and I apologize to you USC fans out there, um, because I'm from Boston. I didn't know that a Bruin was anything other than a Boston thing until I moved to Los Angeles. But um, UCLA many, many years ago did a study and 55% of communication is nonverbal. I can't, I can't, uh, is, is by looking at you. And so if I can't see you, then my ability to communicate with you effectively is significantly reduced. And in negotiation, it's an unbelievable advantage to be able to see who you are negotiating with. It's one of the reasons why some people have said, you know, that COVID's a huge issue in the negotiation realm because there was that, that ability to like be in a room with somebody is limited and we've gone from three dimensions into two dimensions. So if you can come on camera, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you to those who, who did that. 
I'm going to ask when I, I'll throughout the presentation, I'll ask periodic questions and I'll just ask you to type into the chat a one or I'll give you a number. I'll give you a direction of things to chat to type into the chat so that I can just kind of gauge where you guys are at and kind of get your kind of get some ideas and things from you guys, too. So, so thank you. And let's just kind of get started how to ask for more and get it. So I have, if, if it's okay, I'm going to share a little bit of my story. So Mitch told you a little bit, but he, he alluded to the unconventional nature of my background. So I have, in fact, negotiated with 67 of the Fortune 100 and almost half of the Fortune 500, as well as negotiating with and for hundreds of small and mid-size organizations. I've negotiated in mergers and acquisitions. I've negotiated for procurement organizations and I've negotiated in sales. And so I have a very broad brush of business across all types of business contracts from IT and sourcing to services, to professional services, to oil and gas contracts, to finance. I, I've covered most every industry. But I didn't start out doing any of them. Um, I, when I was 19, I discovered I was pregnant and not married, and I wasn't married. I lost my house. I, lost, I got kicked out of my apartment, evicted, and I ended up living in the back of my car. And I was what, was what we call in the United States part of the hidden homeless. And I, when I came out of that, I met this woman who challenged me to write down four goals. And one of the goals that I remember was that I was going to go to Harvard University. I had three kids at the age of 22. I lived on welfare for almost a decade. And I decided that I wanted a different life for myself and for my children. And so I negotiated one. And I ultimately earned my MBA from Harvard University and have done all these really remarkable and amazing things. I'm about to publish my first book called Why Not Ask, a conversation about getting more. And I'm about to launch um, my podcast on the 2nd of March called In the Ven Zone. And the Ven Zone is a place where we find common ground. And you can see it in my logo right there. Um, it's that center part. Um, so let me ask you guys a question. Why do you think that more people are not brilliant negotiators? Just kind of type some things in the chat what you what you think why do you think more people are not brilliant negotiators throw some things up there fear yep fear of rejection never been trained lack of confidence they don't know how to ask for what they want don't know what they're worth You're not seeing, so I don't have, so are you just seeing, so Craig, so um, are you not seeing me or I don't have actually a formal presentation. So I'm not a, I'm not a presentation person, so I don't have slides. So are you guys seeing me, but not slides? All right, cool. Um, cool. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Yeah, I'm one of those rare consultants who doesn't use slides when I present. <laughs> um, I, I like the engagement part more. So, so a lot of things around fear, being turned down, looking out for themselves. But, and one person mentioned it, don't want to be perceived bossy. And, and I knew it was a woman who said that because um, guys don't have that same issue. <laughs> Um, but people are, are definitely not trained. I mean, we go into, unless you, I mean, I'm fortunate because I went to Harvard. I got trained by the, the professors who wrote the book, Getting to Yes, which is an amazing book. And it was an amazing opportunity to learn from them. But they don't negotiate for small businesses and mid-sized companies. They negotiate massive trade deals and international alliances and they all of those kind of things and you and massive organ with massive organizations and what we do as smaller and mid-sized business owners or and sometimes even within our profession we don't have the opportunity to learn negotiation skills so who here just type a one in the chat who here loves to negotiate I just loves it. I know Mitch does. Okay, put a two in the chat if you 
absolutely can't stand it. It's something that you just, you know when you're going to do it. It makes your skin crawl. You get really uncomfortable with it. Type, type a two in the chat. So we have a good mix of, of ones and twos. So who here negotiates as a regular part of your, of your job or in, in the world that you're living in? Type a nine in the chat if you negotiate regularly. Awesome. Because practice is one of the things that most people don't get in negotiation. But who gets, who feels that they get really adequate feedback on whether or not they were effective as a negotiator? Put a four in the chat. I like to change it up a little bit. That you get good feedback on whether or not you were effective. But in most negotiators, what we do is we, we get into a deal and it's like, okay, I signed the contract and that is the metric by which we evaluate whether the deal is good or not. I signed the contract. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest that that is not an effective way of evaluating whether or not you got a good deal. So one of the things that we do as negotiators, and this is true of every single person, I don't care if they are like me and we negotiate for, for a profession and many of you are negotiating regularly, or if you're somebody who doesn't negotiate very often. As soon as you want something from somebody there's this really annoying thing that kind of comes into the play, and that is emotion. You cannot eliminate emotion in your negotiations. E negotiating is inherently an emotional activity. And so what happens, and, and many of you mentioned it in the chat, we become afraid. We become afraid to ask for what we want. We start negotiating against ourselves before we even open our mouths. We say, oh my gosh, if I ask for that, that I'm going to lose that business, or I'll never get that kind of a deal, the supplier will turn me away, or you know, I'll never close that event, or you know, we, we tell ourselves the story in our head. So there are three primary things that we need to do to be really effective negotiators. The first one is we need to get clear. We need to be clear about what we want. Now, this is not necessarily the greatest business example, but I'm going to assume that pretty much everyone on this call, because we are in Los Angeles, California, has bought a car. That's going to be my assumption, that everybody's bought a car. So type in the chat, when you think about buying a new car, what do you care about? What, what do you want when you buy a new car? Just throw a bunch of things in the chat for me. What do you want when you're buying a new car? The best possible price, value, no hassle, reliability, best price, options. So one of the things that, and, and I ask this question when I, when I speak a lot, and nobody's ever come back and actually put this in the chat as an answer. Do you want it today? Because if you want it today, that drives a, an economic value for the car dealership. If you want to order it and wait for it, that has a different value for the dealership. So my grandmother used to say that she always liked to talk about getting into the gnats ass level details, the little tiny nitty gritty things. So I tell this story about how I went to a dealership one year, a few years ago, with the proposal to buy two cars for the price of one. Now, for those on camera, who thinks that that's the craziest thing they've ever heard anyone do? Walk on a dealership and a lot and say, I'm going to buy two cars, but I'm only going to give you money for one. So, so how did I do that? Well, one, I got clear. I created a list of every possible thing that was part of the car, that was part of the car buying experience, that was I, everything. And, you know, and it, they, there were some peculiarities about the car. It was a specific model. I drive a manual transmission. My husband drives a manual transmission. And so there were some peculiarities, but that's part of knowing what it is you want is 
we determined a car that was going to be meet our requirements and it happened to be in kind of a narrower niche. So not everyone's going to be able to buy two cars for the price of one, but I'm trying to give you an example of getting, getting specific about what it is you want. So I had this very long list. Now, did I want all the things on that list? No, they were not important to me. But guess what? Some of the things on that list were important to the dealership. So I took that list, I prioritized it, and I said, these are the things that are most important to me down to the things that are least important to me. And then I, I looked and I said, well, is, I, I wanna buy two cars for the price of one. Is that doable for my counterpart? Can a dealer legitimately sell me two cars for the price of one? Now, nobody, I had nobody like telling me that I couldn't do this. So I just went with it. And then I researched my counterpart because this is the piece that a lot of people really miss in negotiation and including in large, large companies, including people who've been trained a lot. In fact, I spoke at an event a, a few weeks ago and this woman came up to me afterward um, on Zoom in the breakout room and said, I never thought about my counterpart and what my counterpart wanted. I didn't realize that I was supposed to be thinking about that. And that was a huge epiphany for her. So when, you, when I was thinking about this car and I was thinking about the dealership, there were things that I needed to know about the dealer. How do they make money? Is this, what's, what's the market for this car? Who's their competition? Who buys the car? How, what's the financing structure? What's the quality of payment? How many people drive manual transmissions? How expensive it is, is it for a car to sit on a lot? How does the salesperson get, get compensated? How does the manager get compensated? How do they sell? What's their selling behavior with a man versus their selling behavior with a woman? I researched all of that and I created a little spreadsheet. It was nothing hugely sophisticated. And I probably spent about an hour researching all of this. And I discovered through doing math that the dealer legitimately could sell me two cars for the price of one. So I gave my husband a roll. He just drove the car. I actually hated the car <laughs> and um, I didn't really care. And I didn't care. So I didn't have, I didn't have, uh, I, I, I literally was indifferent whether we bought this darn thing or these things or not. But my husband played his role and the deal was that when finances came up that I was going to bring up that conversation, I was going to take over the conversation. And it, over the course of the conversation with the manager, because the salesperson cannot make a, sell, a, a buying or a sales decision, he has to take every offer to, he or she has to take every offer to the manager. I discovered, they disclosed that they, I was wrong about my estimate, estimate on the holding cost of inventory. And I was off by about $5,000. So that night we drove off that car lot with two cars for the price of one plus $5,000. And we did it because I got clear. I got clear on what I wanted and I got clear on what my expectations and assumptions were about my counterpart. And then I, in that conversation I had, I could test those assumptions to see if they were accurate or not and make adjustments as I moved forward. So that is the first step. And in that process, you have to be very careful not to start negotiating against yourself before you've even engaged with your counterpart, which is what so many of us do all the time because we get fearful, we get, we're afraid of rejection, we're afraid of being judged, we, we don't wanna be seen as greedy, we don't wanna ask too much. But as the proverbial saying goes, you don't get what you don't ask for. So better to, and no, except in sex, no means no in sex, but except in sex, no is an invitation to ask a different question. And in negotiation, no is an invitation to ask a different question or even to ask the same question in a different way. Right? So you, you get clear. The next thing you need to do is know how to ask. So put a one in the chat if you love colonial houses and old cars and kind of traditions and, and you, you really, you love like having lots of people around the house and you have like, you love the fireplace and the 
just the cozy comfort of things. Just put, put a one in the chat if you like kind of that kind of world. And put a two in the chat if you like things modern and sleek and high tech and, and just kind of, kind of sexy, for, you find that sexy and appealing, right? So here's the thing. So we divide, we've developed a, a, a quiz that people can take to understand or to learn what their default negotiation style is, which you can find on our website at Venn Negotiation. Um, and we've de determined that they're, we make things super simple because when you're meeting somebody for the first time, how do you know how to communicate to them in a way that actually works for them? So we've broken communication down into two very basic down and dirty kind of buckets. One we call traditional and one we call modern. So the traditional communicator tends to be the person who loves tradition, loves history. They like having, you know, community and lots of people around them and they like to have meetings. They like making sure everybody is in the loop and on the same page at the same time. They like, they tend to, they may be a little more risk adverse. They tend to make decisions that take a little bit longer to make a decision. And they tend to communicate in emails or in their meetings. A modern communicator pretty much doesn't like most of those things. So a modern communicator likes text, bullet points, 10, 15 minute meetings. They hate hour long meetings. They hate long meetings that don't have any outcome or actionable anything that comes out of it. They don't, they don't, they don't put a lot of stock in getting everybody's buy-in. They'd rather just make a decision and move forward and course correct down the road. So if you're a traditional communicator and you like to communicate through emails or, or, or have, have you know, hour long meetings um, and you come to me and I'm a modern communicator and whenever I'm talking about this stuff, I'm giving if ever, any of you ever negotiated with me, you're about to figure out how to negotiate with me. So I'm a modern communicator. So if you send me a five paragraph email or you set up, uh, if you send me a five paragraph email, I am unlikely to read it not out of disrespect it's just that i don't see text that way if you set up an hour-long meeting with me i'm likely to decline it because that's a huge block of time for me to spend so if you need something from me and you're trying to negotiate initiate a relationship and you take a traditional communication approach with me, you're not building goodwill out of the starting gate because negotiation is about accumulating yeses. The more yeses you get early on allows you to deal with the inevitable conflict. Who believes that negotiation is win lose in most situations? Throw a three in the chat. If you think most negotiations are win lose. If you think that most negotiations are win win, throw a six in the chat. So I think that they have nothing to do with winning or losing at all. Negotiation is a conversation about a relationship and you cannot win a relationship. Negotiation is about the hope of a future better together than not doing business together, right? My lawyer friends laugh at me when I say that. They're like, what, what? I'm like, negotiating is a hopeful act. It's a hopeful act. And so when you start building small yeses up front with something as simple as how you email somebody or how you set up a meeting, you're building goodwill that you're able to build on so that when conflict inevitably comes, as it always does in any relationship and needs to be addressed and discussed, you're able to do that a lot more easily because you're building a better and stronger relationship. So once you know your communication attributes, there are four primary negotiation styles, and this is based on research out of Cornell. So the first one I call a champion. A champion is a champion for him or herself. They typically see negotiation as an all or nothing thing. It is a battle. 
they go into it fully armed and fully armored and their objective is to annihilate their opponent in fact i recently had a champion negotiator say to me i care more about not losing than i do winning and that is a, one of it's a classic characteristic of a champion negotiator and what that ends up driving in their behavior is that they'll agree to things that are not necessarily in their best interest if they think it makes their opponent lose more right and that style if that is your negotiation style it's costing you business and you don't even realize it because people are turning away from doing business with you out of the starting gate on my podcast i interviewed a gentleman who owns over 100 franchise organizations throughout the united states and canada and we were talking about this style in particular as it relates to him bringing in new franchisees and he's like I, as soon as I see somebody, I can have a great conversation and then the contracts come out and I, and this person starts going this direction. He's like, I'm done. I'm out next. I move on. He's like, I do not want those people in my organization. I do not want to have to deal with them. There's a cost associated with them. They are going to destroy my team. They're going to be, you know, all these things that he has in his experience seen and that, and that, theme where Kurt comes up over and over. Now that, that style is very good if you are in a win-lose situation and you have to win. If you're in a hostage negotiation situation, although Chris Voss, who's the author of Never Split the Difference, a very good book, would not necessarily agree 100% with this, I'm sure. But if you're in a win-lose situation, you're going to, you, you're going to take a very different, more aggressive style because if you let your opponent, your counterpart win anything, it could cost somebody's life. So you're going to take it, you're going to soften the edges around that champion style, but there are times when it is an effective style. This, and about 10% of negotiators are champions. The next style is a benefactor and it's the, these are my bookends. So the benefactor is the person who abhors all things conflict related. They hate it. When, when, the, when the champion was, the was a child, they were throwing things and throwing temper tantrums. When the benefactor was a child, they probably ran into their room and hid under their pillows. And, they're, and we're all still doing, most of us are still negotiating the, today the same way that we did when we were kids because nobody's taught us to do it in any different way. We've, nobody's ever said, geez, why don't you try this instead? Um, we're just not taught that way. So a benefactor, the challenge for benefactors is that because they're so conflict avoidant, they tend to agree to things not in their best interest because they think that they're preserving the relationship. In reality, what they often end up doing is agreeing to do things they cannot deliver, which ultimately damages the relationship. And they often walk away from the negotiation table feeling used and abused and walked on and mistreated, which then creates a passive aggressive behavior that they sometimes will then sabotage the relationship down the road, damaging the very thing that they think that they care about. And so, but it is a fantastic style if I have somebody, if I have two parties that are like, like wanting to like rip each other to shreds, a benefactor is really good starting to smooth that out. And again, about 10% of benefactors are, uh, negotiators are benefactors. The third style is an ambassador. Now, I often have a, an, an egg on my desk and I forgot to grab my egg. So I have a raw egg on my desk in its shell. So three people want this egg. How do you divide it? Throw in the chat, how do you divide this egg? I have one egg and three people want the egg. How do I divide the egg? Create an omelet, cook it, divide it, scramble it, shell yolk white. Marissa, who's, uh, oh, Marissa, there you go. Shell oak yolk white. You take a pin, you poke a hole in the shell. You drain the yolk from the white, the yolk and the white out of the shell. I have a shell that I can use as a piece of art or I can compost it. I have a yolk that I can use to glaze a piece of baked goods, and I still have egg whites to make an omelet. And so the ambassador naturally thinks about 
how do I divide an egg without breaking it, shattering it, changing its properties and create more value with this one thing? Now, the problem with, with ambassadors, of which I am one, is that we try to complicate everything because it's really annoying for everybody else. <laughs> It's really annoying um, because we're always trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what can I do to make that egg? How do I get that egg? Where do I get the three parts, right? We're always trying to think that. So we can sometimes take too long in the negotiation process. And when we don't have somebody who's cooperating and helping us to figure out how to make that egg three separate parts without destroying anything, we sometimes will become conflict avoidant as well. And so we have to be very careful with that. But an ambassador is excellent at negotiating multi-variable negotiations, multi-party, multi-variable uh, deals. They're very good at it because they see different things in different ways and they're good at bringing disparate ideas together. And then the fourth style and about 20% of negotiators are um, ambassadors. And the fourth style is a maverick. And 55% of negotiators are mavericks, and I call them my checklist people. Now let's think back to that, that car, right? And I said, make that, make a list, make an exhaustive list, right? And the maverick is gonna take that list and they're gonna go, I want heated seats, yes. Well, there's this model that doesn't have heated seats. Well, screw it, I don't want that car then, right? Um, they're gonna want, I don't want this, or the warranty's not this, or they're gonna go through their list and they're gonna go one, item at a time. And they say, did I get this? Yes or no? Did I get this? Yes or no? And let's say there are 10 items on a list and they get eight out of 10 and they go, Woohoo, I got 80%. I did good. But what they missed is that the two things that they didn't get created more value than all of the eight that they did get because they're just going down this list. We call them in negotiation language, we call, them, um, we call them positional negotiators. They negotiate on a position and then they move, then once they have agreement, they move on to the next position. So they lose the opportunity to connect things like the ambassador would normally do. They lose opportunities to connect things and realize value. There's research done by a gentleman named Keld Jensen out of Copenhagen that suggests that widely in a most negotiations, if we're negotiating for a pie that we'll say equals 100, the actual available value is 142. We are leaving 42% of value open to us on the table because all we're looking at is the pie that's right in front of us. We're not looking beyond it. And so, all, the thing about these negotiation styles is we do use all of them at different points, but we do have one that we tend to default to. And the reason why it's important to know these styles, because how you ask and the situations that you're asking in matters. And if you need to bring on the benefactor side of your negotiation style, do that with intention. But if you need to switch it and you need to be more of a champion for whatever reason, then you need to be able to switch it, but do it with intent. And when you do it with intent, that puts you very much in the driver's seat in your negotiation. You are, you are elevating yourself in a major way by being able to do that. So now you've gotten clear on what you want, why you want it, and you've understood your counterpart. You've figured out how to ask who you are. You can estimate who you're, you can kind of get a feel of who your counterpart is by looking at their LinkedIn profile, um, looking at um, different things that they may have published or written, um, or, I mean, there's, an I'll, I'll put a book, a book in the, um, when I'm done speaking, I'll type a book in the, in the chat that talks about, you can actually tell by how people dress in, in many ways, what their style is, what their style might be. So now that you've done those things, the next thing is engaging and making sure that you get what you were told you were going to be given and that you give what you, were, what you said you were going to give. So how we engage, right? So there are a bunch of things around engagement that are really important. And one of them is to have a process. A lot of people go into a negotiation assuming they just kind of go into it. Like I've been in deals where I've had salespeople come in with, you know, a notepad, a pen, 
and you know their iPhone, and that's it. Um, and and they just kind of go through it without kind of based on gut, but there's no process. I was attended a webinar the other day about Brexit, right? And Bre it was actually this really cool Lincoln Douglas style debate. Um, and that this organization was sponsoring about whether Brexit was a successful negotiation. And the problem with Brexit that was everybody who was in the debate agreed is that they had no process. They did not have a pre, they had, did not negotiate the negotiation process. And that's one of the biggest things that you can do to gain control or leverage in your negotiation is to determine what the process of negotiation is with your counterpart and get your counterpart involved in that because again it's an easy thing actually to get agreement on a process for how you're going to go things if you're dealing with procurement people in a big organization um, you you know they may say well this is my process and it's like all right so this is your process this is how we do our process where can we fit in and how do we make that work and you make that part of the agreement again to build those yeses the other thing you need to do when you're when you once you've started once you've engaged is making sure like i know and i know a lot of times this is hard to do and and this stuff is it's important whether you're negotiating from a business or whether you're negotiating for yourself from a job perspective these processes and these steps are valid across any type of negotiation even if you're negotiating with your spouse just ask my husband um so the so the thing is is that you when you once you're engaged you and you have your you may have meetings around your negotiations um conversations etc make sure you're documenting what you've agreed to and what's still open what are the open items take meeting minutes and and send them to your counterpart and say this is what we talked about this is what we agreed to these are the things that are still open and this is what our next steps and who owns them right that co-ops your counterpart into the process and it allows and creates an environment of joint problem solving so and accountability and that's what any good relationship and negotiation is a conversation about a relationship that's what any good relationship has every good relationship has boundaries every good relationship has a set of rules by which it operates i mean i kind of joke and say my husband and i've been married 20 almost 28 years and the deal we entered into when we got married is not entirely the same deal we have today because we're a lot older we don't have kids at home um, we're working from home and that changed the whole kind of dynamic and we're just not the same people so why do we expect in business why do we expect our business partners and our in our business relationships to stay the same we enter into relationships and contracts with companies and organizations and individuals and it's like i've negotiated contracts that are 20 years old that have had virtually no changes to them i'm like who the heck, I mean, I'm thinking back 20 years ago in 2001, I mean, holy crap, NASDAQ had dropped 80% 80, 80 and, you know, the dot-com bubble was bursting. I mean, there's just a totally different world. And so we need to, we need to acknowledge that. And we do that through the process. We do that through transparency and communication. And then you need to make sure that you set up a process. If it's a long-term contract or long-term relationship, you need to set up a process of renegotiation. And there's a lot of talk right now about, you know, customers for lifetime. But if you don't have a stated policy around negotiating or renegotiating, then you really don't believe, I contend, in a, having a customer for a lifetime because you've not established a process for dealing with these changes. And if you buy into the, to, to my view, that negotiation is a hopeful act, then renegotiation is a no brainer because if you want to keep that customer for as long as possible, then you want to be able to have that renegotiation, keeping in mind that you obviously have to maintain fiduciary responsibility over anything you're doing. So it's a two way street just because they need to renegotiate if, and what they want to do may not work for you. And then dissolution is also a negotiation about a relationship and also not a business thing, but I just negotiated my first divorce. 
a friend of mine asked for help. She and her husband had a, had a property. Uh, they had a horse ranch. Um, it was had sold for two and a half million dollars. They were trying to figure out how to distribute the funds. And, you know, the husband started out, it's, these are the numbers, and if she doesn't like it, she can sue me. Three days later, he gave her everything. And two days after that, she gave him 50% of it back, plus $50,000 because he had given her a business loan. She calls it a good karma divorce. But they have grandkids together, right? If you are in a business situation and you're, you, have a, you have a divorce from a customer or supplier or an investor or a, a partner, you still have a relationship because you still have a reputation in the market. So how you dissolve those relationships matters. And so you've got, so, so you now know, get clear how we talked about how to ask with respect to negotiation styles and then engaging and then making sure that you get what you said you were going to be given. And, and that's, that's negotiation right there. And again, it's just a conversation about a relationship and you cannot win a relationship. I hope this was helpful and informative. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. All right, guys, ask some questions. You got her attention. Get your questions answered. If it's something that you want to have in public, you can private message her in the chat box. Otherwise, ask away. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Eric. Hi there. So many of my negotiations happen around the world of real estate. And mm -hmm. oftentimes the homeowner has their mind set on a price because of what they've seen on, let's just say Zillow and, or what they've heard from their neighboring friends. Uh, but that's really not the reality of, of where we need to be or where we want to be. And oftentimes it's just not even realistic for the condition of the home. But what I find is that oftentimes the book just stops there because they feel that if I can't get this value that I'm so hung up on, then it's not worth it to me. So my question, my question is, is how do we help them kind of get over that hump and start to actually, I guess, come down to earth and, and then have a, a, a good exchange to where we can arrive at um, what we both want? Well, I love this question, Eric. So, so I, like I said, I'd, I've worked with a lot of procurement organizations as well as working in sales. And I have a very unusual view about anything to do with price. Price is an output of a negotiation. It is not what should be negotiated. Because and, and, and a, in a house, it's absolutely an output. But we've, we've flipped it on our head. We flipped this concept on the head to say price is what we negotiate. But it's not really. If you think about what are all the things that matter that go into an influence Price. What are the assumptions around how you get to a price? Because you don't just like pull a price out of the air. Even if you do, even if somebody did just pull the price out of the air, there's still some logic in their own minds about what they use to get to that price, right? There's behind any dollar number, there are assumptions. Negotiate the assumptions. So in the case of the of a house, it's like you know, depending on the different features that are there, depending on how well it's maintained, depending on the neighborhood. And you, you, start, to, you start to focus on those things and then assign value to them. So you, trying to get them to move off the price component to start with and focus on what that list is and then getting them to prioritize what are the most important things and then you can start assigning value to those those things versus assigning value first and then trying to pin the tail backward on the donkey um, and do it do it so that you're thinking about what are those what are the because everything can be so i've, I've done a lot i've done a lot of mergers and acquisitions and everything can be value there uh, there can, i can i can tell you i can figure out how to price anything 
I could sit and come up with a model that would tell you how to price a hug, right? especially in COVID, and it'd be worth a lot, right? So you can come up with a price for anything, which is why price, if, I, if, if people would just stop treating price as an input to a negotiation and start treating it as an output of a conversation, that is going to be, that, that's the way that I have successfully been able to, to address that. I don't know if that helps, Eric. It, it does tremendously. It goes back to, I need to understand why they're selling that property and dig in on the motivation behind that. So here's an interesting thing. So the worst question that you can, the worst question, or I don't want to say the worst, the least effective question you can ask anybody in a negotiation starts with the word why. Um, Randy, can I pick on you for a minute? Absolutely. All right. Randy, why are you wearing a checked shirt today? I thought it would be better than my t-shirt I had on right before the call. So how did you feel when I asked you that why question? What was your, what, how did you react? Your body actually reacted when I asked you that question. Well, if it, if it, to you reacted in a negative way, uh, that's not how I feel. I'm a pretty open person. If you mm -hmm. said, uh, you could probably ask me anything and I wouldn't, I pretty much wear everything on my sleeve. So it didn't bother me at all. So your, your, so your body said something different because you, your body, your upper body moved a little bit, but it might, it might not. But if somebody actually said something that was more critical, maybe of your shirt, um, the, the, the challenge with a why question is it usually, thank you, Randy, I appreciate that. The challenge with a why question, how did other people feel when I asked him that question? Let me go there. Did anyone, did anyone kind of go, why is she asking that question? Yeah, she's pretty <laughs> maybe, direct. Maybe I didn't like his shirt. <laughs> Maybe I didn't like his shirt, right? I so think the what you were was, why does it matter? Yeah. Why does it matter, right? So exactly. So the thing is, is that why questions put us in a defensive posture. And when you're trying to build goodwill, what and how questions are far more effective. So if you say, what might we do versus even what should we do, right? But re get rid of the whys and replace them with what and how. Because what you're doing when you say, when you say why is there's, there is this accusatory thing at times and people will go back into their mom or dad screaming at them when they're a kid, why did you do that kind of thing? Versus what and how, which co-ops your counterpart again into helping solve problems. If you say, what should we do? That's not as effective as saying, what might we do? Using the word might opens up the mind to possibilities. And you'll be, you'll be amazed at what, how that, what, how different your conversations are simply by using, using that. Somebody had thrown, um, Let's see what we have. Often we have little time to get to know the individual that we are negotiating with, like the car dealer. How do you get to know that person's style? Sometimes it feels like you're on a blind date. Yeah, that that's true. Um, so, and and it, part of it is through asking effective questions. So I always go into. I'm a very data oriented negotiator. So I research like, and when in my programs that we do and, and that we teach and, and things I write, I, I like research, 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 research. Data is my best friend in a negotiation because it helps me to take emotion away from, not eliminate emotion, but it helps me kind of put emotion in a box for myself so that I can control my emotions more effectively. And it gives me something that is more challenging for somebody to have a contentious issue with. Because the alternative facts aside, facts are facts. And so when you, have, when you have data, as long as you're agreeing to the assumptions, then data is just like price, and price is a piece of data, is, is just an output. 
And so once you get that agreement, that makes a difference. But in terms of figuring out how to build rapport quickly, most today you can, there's this really great, so this book is called Why They Buy. And it's by a woman named Sherry Tree, and I highly recommend it. She takes and she spins the whole buying conversation and converts it into a value-based conversation. We buy based on our values that are important to us. Some of us care about prestige and, and you know, nice, having nice cars and fast decision-making. Others care about, you know, having deep knowledge about something and you can't sell those people because they, they have to sell themselves. And, and, and then there are two other styles. But um, what that has that helps a lot in being able to figure out who somebody at least on the surface who somebody is but it's really comes down to asking effective questions so i go into a situation having an assumption about what i think somebody is or having a view um, of how they might negotiate and and like in the car dealer it wasn't about the person i i knew how i figured out how salespeople were trained to deal with men versus women and that made a big difference. I hope, I hope that helps. Um, Rita. Thank you, Christine. It's been such a pleasure listening to you speak today. Um, quick question. So how do you see kind of the future negotiation now that we have so much technology and AI and automation? Where do you see this industry going? And is this really a soft skill that's going away? That's, a, that's a, I mean, obviously you asked it, therefore it is a good question, but um, I love that question. I've actually been doing a lot of research on that um, and actually I'm working on creating an AI product for small and mid-sized companies. Um, so AI is going to change a cer certain aspects of negotiation. Um, lawyers' roles are going to change dramatically as a result of AI. I don't know that they realize it yet. Um, right now, it's really restricted to pretty much restricted to very large organizations in their contract management systems and um, and it's expensive and so and it takes a lot of process effort um, so I don't think it's I don't think it's in the short term I think we've got um, I don't think it's imminent but I, I think it's coming now I think AI is really effective for helping us assess risk um, and we didn't really talk a lot about it, but like I talk, I love contracts and I talk a lot about contracts and, um, and, and contracts are just risk mitigation tools. And I have a way of helping people understand contracts very simplistically by breaking it down into five categories. I believe that can be absolutely, man, and, and the, I don't even want to call it AI, let's just call it machine learning because we really aren't at a level where we have AI to um, across most things. We're still at the machine learning level, but it is going to change. Um, it, I, I hope that it impacts our ability to look at possibilities and look at options because the human mind just gets so focused on what, on what's in front of it that it doesn't, um, it doesn't explore the possibilities as much as it could. And I think machine learning and AI can help us become more creative in our um, problem solving. Awesome, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Christine, we have about two minutes left. And there is a question. Um, let's see. Uh, what about proposal? More time. Oh, how do you negotiate for more time for a meeting? Well, this is going to sound trite, but the first thing is you ask. Um, so, right? It's like so. Ask for it and explain why what the rationale is for needing it. What is the benefit to having more time for the meeting? Um, what outcome is more likely to be achieved as a result of having a longer, a longer meeting, a longer session? Um, and, you know, I go into meetings when I'm negotiating, I go into meetings with a very specific agenda. And I actually send my agenda to my counterparts in advance and say, these are the things that I want to cover. Do you have things that you would like to add? So I actually invite the opportunity of my counterpart to, and give them the opportunity to add to the schedule. And then if they come back and they've added like six things, then, then it's like, okay, then I think we either need to break this up into two meetings or we need to have a longer session. So that's, that's the strategy I, I've used very effectively over the years. 
Very cool. I really appreciate all of you being here. I really do hope that this was helpful and informative for you guys. And uh, I, I hope you stay in touch with me. I think somebody put my contact information um, in the chat. Uh, and I've just, you know, thank you very much. And, and, and Mitch and to the, to the team here, thank you very much for moderating and, and for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Christine. We really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for attending our meeting today. We hope it was beneficial for you. Thanks to all of our HSMAI Los Angeles board members for attending today and for their support uh, for the, our beautiful hospitality association and the hospitality industry as a whole. We're gonna get over this thing. We're gonna get through this thing and things are gonna improve pretty rapidly. Um, we bid you a farewell and thank you for attending today. Bye-bye.